Hello friends and good morning on this Friday in November. It is good to gather with you together today. I'm Pastor Lori Landon from First UMC in Kirksville and I hope that whatever this week has brought your way, you've had a few minutes to pause and consider the question, how is it with your soul? Now, depending on the week that you've had and what you have in store with Thanksgiving next week, there could be a lot of different ways that you answer that question. Know that whatever your answer is, you are not alone. God is with you in both the joys and sorrows of life, as well as the times where you are simply on autopilot just trying to get through the day. This month, we've been working through the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. And these rather unique blessings are invitations from Jesus into a different way of life than we encounter elsewhere. And they reveal a bit more about what God's vision for the beloved creation is. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice and righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Those are the ones we've tackled so far and taken a look. Now, some of these Beatitudes are challenging, and this week's is no different. Blessed are those who are mistreated for doing good, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And now, this Beatitude is translated in several different ways in the English. Sometimes our Bible translations will read, blessed are those who suffer, um, or blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, Regardless of the exact words used, this beatitude serves as an invitation to keep doing good and following the ways of Jesus, even when it may result in suffering. And even when we may wonder, but I did all the right things. Why is this happening? It's certainly easier to do good when we're rewarded for it or when people respond kindly but there are times that it doesn't happen that way. We can probably all think of a time that we've done something kind for someone else and it has backfired in some way. Either it's had repercussions on us or we've done something kind for someone and our takeaway is, oh my goodness, how ungrateful they were. Our first instincts when that kind of thing happens is to go on the defensive. Um, and we might ask, well, what did I do to deserve this? We vent our frustrations to others. Sometimes we want to strike back. Um, we might, might vow never to make that choice again. Like, well, I'm never going to help anybody I see on a street corner again if they're just going to turn around and throw away the food I gave them. If we're not careful, our experience of the pain from our doing good will be transmitted to others. It's kind of like that old fable where the person goes to work and they're mistreated by their boss and they go home and they shout at their spouse who turns around and loses their temper at the oldest child who then takes it out on the youngest child who kicks the dog and bites the cat and so on and so forth. It can become a vicious cycle. Jesus invites us into breaking that cycle and responding without violence and to accept that sometimes suffering is the cost of doing good. Now that's possibly one of the teachings of Jesus that is the hardest to accept. The way he lived though, he, he lived this out. He responded calmly to accusations instead of launching a defense he surrendered to arrest instead of fighting back. He modeled a different way of living that chooses good over evil instead of becoming a part of that cycle. Now, 
we've been using the ninefold path of Jesus, Hidden Wisdom of the Beatitudes by Mark Scandret to help guide us through this series. And the author points out that this beatitude does not mean that those experiencing domestic violence or mistreatment based in prejudice just need to put up with it. And what he writes is, the ordering of the Beatitudes is important. First, trust the Creator's care. Then lament what is broken and wait for divine comfort. Affirm your inherent dignity and worth. Embrace your agency and power. Receive mercy and respond with compassion. Tell the truth and live wholeheartedly. Reach past differences to find common ground. And only then can you confidently resist evil through nonviolence. The surrender response to suffering must come from a place of strength, confidence, and courage of walking with Jesus in this. So when we speak calmly to de-escalate a situation, when we pray for those who treat us badly, when we bless those who hurt us, and somehow we resist going straight into defense mode, we practice this invitation of Jesus. And if we're not sure how to begin, maybe we start with prayer. For the one who is triggering our defense, for the one who is mistreating us, even though we're trying to do good, may you find peace, embrace goodness and love, and experience what is most real and true. Now, we don't have to say that out loud. Maybe we can simply remind ourselves of that blessing towards someone else. Because we're all children of God. We're all struggling. We're all trying to do our best. And this beatitude invites us to move from an instinct of reacting defensively to a posture of nonviolent reaction instead and accepting that sometimes doing good may bring suffering. Blessed are those who are mistreated for doing good, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. May we resist evil, embrace suffering when it does come, commit to doing good no matter what the cost, and follow Jesus in walking in the way of surrender. Have a good week in these days ahead, and I will see you next week as we wrap up this series with the final beatitude. Take care, friends.